I don't know if I'm going to be able to preach this service without Tony here. Tony kind of co-preaches with me. So <laughs> makes me think I'm almost in a black church. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll have to issue whoop towels so you all can get your whoop on. The message this morning is afraid to be seen. And of all of the stations of the cross that we're going to do in this sermon series as we lead up to Good Friday, this one I think in particular we should feel in the church. You know, it should make us a little bit more uncomfortable than, than the other stops along the way to Good Friday. And that's partly because it is an acknowledgement in John 12 that there are people who believed in Jesus, and so there are people who believe in Jesus and yet choose to be more influenced by the Pharisees. And I'll let you decide who the Pharisees are. More that the the regard of the Pharisees is more important than the regard of God. And that should be a scary thing to think about. I realize we're in the Bible Belt, so you'll say, well, that never happens. <laughs> that never happens. But obviously it does. That's why it's in the Bible. It's why it is here. It's why it's for us to consider Remember, we're in this period where Jesus is going to be hanging from a cross in just a few days. And so this is something that happens to anyone that is totally committed to God's purpose. And if you're totally committed to God's purpose, even amongst religious people, you will have to decide whether you're going to to going to deny Christ or not. You know, we always focus on the garden and we focus then on Peter around, you know, the, the, the high priest's courtyard. But I want to say denying Christ happened a lot earlier and this John 12 passage shows that it does. It began with, and yet, and that means there was something before that was in contrast to it. And so the verse before said, even though Jesus has done all these mighty, mighty miracles, people didn't believe in him. And yet, so you think, oh good, there's hope. Whew, there's Texas. There's the Bible Belt. And yet, there were leaders who believed in him. And, and, and remember, there was a lot of pressure. That, that was commitment from the leaders because the Pharisees, there was all this peer pressure to deny Christ and to say he's not the Messiah, he's not the fulfillment of the old covenant, he's not all of these things, and yet, so you're saying, okay, good, we've made it, we've made it, we've made it to this place. So as you look about all the crazy stuff in the news, you can say, well, I know what they're doing in California, and yet in Texas we're not doing that, right? No, we would never deny Christ. Well, what kind of things are we afraid of? Because that's why the Isaiah 51 portion is there. And, and, and I really thought, you know, not, it's, it's not only the tie-in that in Isaiah 51, God is reminded him saying, I'm the one who comforts you. And who is this I? This is the I who created the dirt clod that you're riding around the sun on. I am the one who set all the stars in motion. And, I, and I'm going to spend a little time there. Or I'll take a detour right now. Because I think science holds more awe for us. And I realize I'm, I'm going down a, a, a dangerous place because it's so easy to be branded as unscientific. But I think you've got to be willing to be branded unscientific. But I think you can do it by saying, I am for real science, and then define it to the person who's trying to silence what you're saying about Jesus. And you say, if it can be replicated in 
you know, again and again, then it's science. If you can't replicate it, it's not science. And what am I talking about? Well, no one has ever replicated the Big Bang. They can't even replicate a little bang. What would a little bang look like? If you ever get someone who can create out of nothing and get something, something out of nothing, that is the Big Bang in a sense. It's in the biggest scale possible so that people say, well, then, well, that's so big, we couldn't replicate that in a lab. I'm okay with that. Make a dirt clod. Make a dirt clod. I'd be okay with that. You make a dirt clod and I will suddenly start believing in the Big Bang. But if you can't do a dirt clod, then your statement is as much faith as mine. And in this thing, or in this dialogue that we're hearing in Isaiah 51, God reminding his people, he's not speaking to non-believers there either in Isaiah 51, he's speaking to his people, saying, I am your God, and you're afraid of people. And these people are like grass. They're, why are you afraid of them? They're, they're going to wither just like grass. And yet I'm the guy who makes permanent things. I made the universe. I made, well, even if things that aren't so permanent, like the sea. The fact that there's no sea in heaven, and we're told there is no sea in heaven, and I have to remind all my sailors that there is no sea in heaven. It says it in Revelation. That even the fact that there is no sea was a decision from the creator to say, okay, psh, gone. And all of this power he manifests, why are you afraid of people? And you say, well, we're not afraid of people. Well, you're going to hear a couple of David Batcher's bugaboo list. It's, they're nice straw men. I, I think pretty safe. Uh, I'm not a, I, I've told you before, the real moral hero is Glinda. It's not her husband. It is Glinda, knowing what Glinda will give me that look that gives me courage. <laughs> Without the fear of that look, I wouldn't have any moral courage at all. <laughs> so I'm going relatively to a safe place, but it's still going to step on a couple of toes here. You say, we do everything the Lord commands us. Yeah, I, I, I hear, you know, you can say, oh, he's setting us up now. I mean, who even lives by the 10 commandments, let alone the 613 other, or the 603 other commandments of the Old Testament, right? We can't even keep the 10, the basic ones. We're, we're grateful there aren't more. But there are some things that since creation, God has told us to do and we don't do. But let's, let's first talk with Jesus and, and what his basic instructions were. We were to go out, they were to go out and heal people. You say, we pray for healing. And that's true, I'm, I'm not taking that away. And, and there are miracles in this congregation, people get healed, so not, not underplaying that. But part of that healing, he says, and pray for the dead. So it's very easy for me to say, how many of you have stood by Let's take a road accident. I, I, I realize sometimes when you're praying for a 95-year-old or a 96-year-old to come back from the dead, you're not doing them any favors, okay? So I'm excluding that. There's times where the family wants you to pray for them to go on, and it's the right time. I'm praying for that. I'm talking about praying for that tragic death. That like, you know, as a soldier, if I'm standing by a blown-up Humvee and there's body parts hanging out, I have to challenge myself to say, can, do I really believe that right now I could pray and this Marine would come back to life? And you maybe have come up on that car accident or that tractor that's rolled over or, or whatever, that tragic thing or even something like meningitis. Yeah, I heard of somebody with a meningitis case last week and, and you know, meningitis will kill you quick. And have you stood there and said, Jesus, what would Jesus have me do? You know, WWJD. What did he have the first disciples do? Pray for the dead. And the dead came back to life. And by signs and wonders. And if we wonder, why isn't Uvalde being transformed? Maybe it's because the church is more worried and not looking foolish. Let me tell you, when you're standing there over a dead body, praying for it to come back to life, your fellow Christians are going to say, oh, that's a bit too far. That's cray-cray. Right? I got somebody agreeing with me here. 
Good. Tony is, Tony is channeling here. It's not just the praying, because if it's just praying, it's just it's as much a Pharisaic thing as anything else. But if it's believing in the praying, if it's really believing God that he wants to be shown strong. How many of you know God wants to be shown strong? And one of the things, you know, as he as says, my light shines brightest in the weakest vessels. So it, it's, you know, you don't, it's, it's one thing when the pastor prays for somebody to come back from the dead, you say, ah. But when the weakest is standing there reminding the church, accusing the church in, in love to say, can we believe God for this body coming back to life? If you talk to missionaries, that happens all the time in the Philippines. It happens in Africa. It happens a lot of places, but it doesn't happen in America because we're too worried about how cool we look. Because you're thinking, what if he doesn't come back? It says you're then more afraid of how the regard of human beings than you are about God's regard towards you. Because Jesus said, pray for the dead. Now, you're going to say, well, okay, I'm going to start doing that. That's not what we take away from this, I hope. It is to A, lose our fear of mankind, because that was the Isaiah 51 thing. And, and I would almost say, if we could just lose our fear. Have you read all the accounts of how fearful our children are? You know why our children are fearful? Because their parents are afraid. There's so many things we're worried about. And that's what God was speaking to the people in Isaiah's time to say, what are you so worried about the oppressor? You know, for us, what are you worried about terrorists? What are you worried about lone wolf shooters? I mean, we have a reason to be afraid, right? In theory, we say. What if there's another Salvador Ramos somewhere in here? Some kook sitting in his little dark room on the internet, ready to go off again. Have you seen what our children have to, well, I know you've seen it because even I as pastor, every road it seems I drive on goes by a school and every school, we didn't have that much armor in Afghanistan and Iraq in front of us and we had real enemies out there all the time. What are you afraid of, church? They are like grass, they will pass away. If you really believe that I'm the God who creates out of nothing, this is a situation where I can create out for you. But are you afraid to be seen with me? You know, part of it, that silent prayer in your car as you drive by is one thing, and I'm not saying don't do that. I am just saying your public prayer is where God says, that shows you trust me. When you stand in front of this thing or next to this thing or at this meeting, and you step up to the mic knowing as soon as you speak, your fellow Christians are going to cat call you down. Oh, no, I can't believe you went there. You regard man more than God. Jesus has done all these mighty miracles, and we say he's done these mighty miracles, yet we really don't trust him in this instance. I've got one more area I'm going to go because that was, you know, that's kind of easy. That's out there. But this one, well... You know, it says in Revelation that by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, the gates of hell are broken down. The devil is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So, let's get personal. How many of you have eight children? Eight. You heard me right. I said eight. It's not a magic number. It's not a biblical number, but at least it's not seven. Say, when you say seven, you're saying, oh, you're just being holy. We know that seven, you've been in Sunday school. I'm going to say eight. We don't have that many children in America, do we? And even in the Bible Belt, we don't have that many children. But I would challenge you, is there a single verse on contraceptive any, anywhere in the Bible? No. Just again and again, be fruitful and multiply. The person with lots of kids has lots of arrows in their quiver. We have all of these commandments to trust God. We don't. We say, mm, he doesn't know that having more than two is pretty dang expensive. 
Have you paid for a quinceanera recently? If you have, you'll never go to, th- well, you probably stopped with one. When you have your first daughter, you'll never have another. Or even looking at what it costs to marry one off. Yes, Willow, you are a drain on resources. No. <laughs> She woke up. She goes, why am I mentioned? Please don't look at me. Okay. But it is one of those things that in the church, we just accept that. We never challenge anybody. Now, it's true if you haven't had any, then it's very uncomfortable to be in church because then everyone will ask you, especially if you're newlywed, when are you going to have a kid? I'm not saying that this isn't an awkward topic. I'm just using that as an example because Glinda and I... We're challenged by God on that subject. We were watching Mother Teresa beat the heck out of Bill Clinton one day at the National Prayer Breakfast, and her little Romanian or Hungarian, whatever she was, her little Slavic fist came out of the TV and hit both of us on the jaw because she was saying, you know, people trust God for the enjoyment of being married, but they don't trust God for the other half of the gift, which is children. And I said, dang it. But at the time, I didn't know that Glenda had the exact same reaction. She said, dang it. It was only a few days later when I got the faith to come up to her to say, you know the other day with Mother Teresa, she goes, you too? I mean, we instantly knew. We'd both been challenged on the same thing. And at that point in our married life, we had already experienced a bunch of pregnancies and lost them all, okay? We had... Three lost pregnancies before our son, two more lost pregnancy, and then our daughter. And then the other daughter, the third one, the the mother of Blessed Gabe, who you'll meet at 10 (laughs) o'clock, she wasn't even on our plan. Linda had already decided we weren't going to have but the two. So thankfully, God surprised us. But immediately, as Glenda knew that she was carrying the third child, she's like, she made a doctor appointment for me. Let's just leave it there. And we carried out that doctor's appointment. So when Mother Teresa was talking, it was already, according to man, physically impossible to have more children with David and Glenda. But repentance means not just saying you're sorry. It means executing an about face and going back the other way that you were going. When you're going this way, and you realize you're wrong, you say you're sorry, you go back the other way. That's repentance. So for us, I had to say to God, we're not only sorry, and we've already done this thing that according to man is unalterable, well, relatively unalterable. Certainly for our finances then, I was a seminary student, and I had to say to the Lord, Lord, we are sorry, and we're broke, and it's going to cost multiple thousands that we don't have to show you how sorry we are. But if you'll open the door, we'll walk through it. That's what we have to be able to do to God, to say, we're sorry, we can't see how we can change this thing, but you're God, you created the heavens and the earth, and if you'll open the door, a true sign of repentance is, we'll walk through it. So that's what we did, we just said to God, show us the money, and we'll walk through it. And he did. So we did. Now, Glenda got stopped in traffic in 1994. Some of you may remember 1994. Some of you are not even on planet Earth in 1994. And he said to her, you will be like Sarah. Now, you may remember what Sarah is famous for. Having a kid as a senior citizen. So Glenda and I, from 1994 on, in faith, have to believe God for that. And for this other word, through Mother Teresa. It may happen while we're here in Uvalde, but Glenda's got a little bit more time on the clock. She's not 80 yet. But who knows? Who knows? I mean, anything's possible with God, right? But part of it is, Glenda and David continually have to be saying, Lord, you told us that we are to be fruitful and multiply, and it doesn't matter the age. As God said, not just to Sarah, but to Hannah and, um, and Elizabeth. You know, it's this thing. Through, to have kids in your old age is a sign of God's power and its foolishness to man. 
man laughs. That's why Isaac is even named Isaac. It means he laughed. It's one of those funny things. I'm not saying that, well, it would be great if we had, if we were like this pew over here. If every pew right now were wiggling and getting tired and saying, will that guy ever shut up so we can get back to the cookies and Kool-Aid? But it is a challenge to us to say, where is it that something that we've been conditioned by our culture to think is impossible, we're going to stand up and look crazy? And yet, the leaders believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess him publicly. They didn't want to be seen with him, afraid to be seen. It is time to be, well, to get over that fear. Get over that fear. If you've prayed for revival in Uvalde, guess what? Part of the reason it hasn't happened yet is because the church has been afraid to be seen. Not just in the easy stuff, the street corner evangelism standing out there like every other church that came to Uvalde in May and June and were doing all this public witness. That's great, but that doesn't transform as much as people who know you and who know me, and they see us do something bold. They see something that's dead and us speaking to it, whether it's a human body or some other thing we said is not possible. A marriage that has been restored. Divorced people coming back together and getting remarried. There's just a bunch of things that we could show our faith in and speak to as if it was, even though to the world it's not. That's what the church must do. That's what we must do in front of those who know us to know this really is repentance. This really is faith. This really is someone who's not afraid to be seen with Jesus. It didn't work for Jesus, obviously. He keeps going until Good Friday. But part of the thing that church can do is repent and not be afraid to be seen with him. Let us pray. Oh Lord, forgive us that in this beautiful house that the generations in front of us have provided let us not be afraid to lose it all if needs be, but to be authentic for you and to live in the faith of those who spoke a church into existence on the hill country, or in the hill country of Texas. But let us be true disciples and be willing to speak to a new thing now in the days in which we live. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen.